I am happy to introduce former NFL star gone reality television, Ryan Hogue. Ryan, what's going on, my friend? Good morning, Matt. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. Anytime. Thank you for being uh, on Patriots Corner today. Now, Ryan, uh, you know, we were just down at Mount Laurel together uh, at NFL Films, the broadcast boot camp. You did a fantastic job. What did you get out of it? You know, it was an amazing experience, and I actually tried to do it last year, and I got waitlisted. So to be able to do it this year was was an accomplishment. Uh, number one, it's just fun to be around the guys again. It's a locker room type atmosphere. There's only about 24 of us that were accepted. And, uh, you know, I've been out of football long enough that I forgot what it's like, you know, that, that brotherhood, that family. And, uh, so th that's something that I, I certainly missed and, and cherished being there this week, but ultimately, you know, learning <clears throat> from the absolute best, James Brown, he had the top, uh, you know, the hiring producer at Fox to CBS to NFL network, you're getting eyeballs on you in, you know, every uh, <clears throat> with regards to every single aspect as it pertains to broadcasting. So it's it's really a fun and and challenging experience, and and you really find out, you know, if you if you're up for it and if you have the chops for it. Yes. Now, Ryan, one thing I knew you had before, uh, you know, even you had a leg up before other people who were at the boot camp as well. You were on reality television. Yeah, I was, and and anybody that knows anything about reality te television knows that it's anything but reality. I mean, it's generally you know eighty percent scripted, and we have to fall into a character that they kind of design for you. And if you don't, that's why a person lasts longer than others. Uh, so I, I do have that acting experience. I've also modeled since two thousand and four. Uh, my second year in the league. So I, I have, you know, a lot of experience in front of a camera, be it the modeling side or the acting or the reality TV side. So, um, you know, that, that certainly makes me more comfortable being in front of a camera. Now, when you say scripted, and I don't want to expose, I don't know the different, um, you know, rules of after the show. Uh, you know, I know they do do the men tell all, obviously, but, um, you know, my mom is a huge fan of The Bachelor, everything with The Bachelor. You were on The Bachelor, I know, in, in 2012. What was that like, the transformation? You know, you had gone playing on team, you know, gone from playing on teams such as the Redskins, the Raiders, the Jaguars, to now being on The Bachelor with a bunch of guys who, you know, were they were not in the NFL. And you have a leg up. What was it like making that initial transformation? Yeah, you know, so I was on it twice, sadly, to uh, admit. I was on it in 2008, The Bachelorette, and then The Bachelor Pad in 2012. And, you know, I, I don't know that I had a leg up, per se, just simply because I, you know, granted, I, I came from a competitive background, so I was used to competing against other guys, but for me, I went in there with the mentality of my goal is not to win because if I win, I'm going to end up on one knee marrying somebody that I potentially shouldn't be marrying. Right. So I wanted to genuinely go on and meet somebody that whether or not we clicked great. But uh, so whereas there are a lot of guys there that were there just to try to win and I, I'm a genuine dude. So I was like, look, I'm not going to, be on the show and, and try to beat somebody simply for the, you know, thrill of beating them. And, and I think the re part of the reason I got casted was they thought, you know, typical football player, he's going to do anything and everything to win. And my mentality was, look, she should be interviewing us just like we should be interviewing her to see if she's the right fit. And uh, so with that being said, you know, I, I realized real early that she wasn't somebody worth fighting for, and therefore I didn't last very long. Well, that's something, you know, I have always said to my mom and, and, and you know, and my sisters. They're big fans as well. And it is a great show, you know, to watch for people on the outside who are sitting on the couch watching. Uh, you know, and I always get the normal match shut up, the bachelor's on, <laughs> or the bachelorette's on, go somewhere else, uh, you know, but... 
going into that initially, what was it like? Because did you, you know, even on the first day, uh, you know, the first episode, were there guys who were giving hints that they were only there to be on television? Oh, absolutely, Matt. It's a it's a gong show. Uh, not only do they not feed you, they just they give you top shelf alcohol the entire time you're there. So, and I'm not a drinker, so that didn't affect me. But everybody just gets wasted. You you know, with the exception of maybe a handful of guys of the 25 that were on my season, you know, there are a couple obvious picks from the producers that had no business being on TV in general, but they were just there because they're going to give you a couple good sound bites week one, and then they're going to get sent home. Then the others were there just because they were trying to build a brand. There was one guy that ends up winning that's there just promoting his clothing line. And he's giving out clothing to everybody to wear because he was trying to promote that company. There's aspiring actors. There's guys that want to move to LA after the show because, you know, for that next nine, 10 months, you're, you're the flavor of the month really, or the flavor of the year. And you can capitalize on that, be it a, you know, a a bar, uh, show up at a bar and, and get paid for a, you know, a, uh, that kind of engagement or what have you. So uh, it's a really a mixed bag. But yeah, the, these guys, for the most part, you know, this fairy tale of fi- finding love, especially when it's 25 guys and one girl, that that's not what these guys were all about. I know. And I found it, I, you know, I find it so funny, too, because I did watch the, uh, you know, the season with my, my family. And I remember one uh, particular piece of the beginning episode, I think a guy walked out and totally interrupted you. The guy looked like he was like just a regular soccer dad. You know how you were saying, you know, <laughs> people who cast them who shouldn't shouldn't be there, but the producers know they're going to give some sense of enjoyment, whether people in the audience are just giggling at them from their couch or, you know, who knows. But yes, I find it very funny as well. Yeah, and, you know, and that kind of thing gets staged every time. Anytime somebody gets interrupted, the producer are holding you, holding you, holding you. Okay, go now. So they may, you know, they they generate these false sense of, you know, animosity between two people. And, and in reality, it's it's all it's all a show. It's all fake. That is too funny. Now, and then you went back on for Bachelor Pad. Was that much different? You know, what was the uh, initial thought in your head when you got, you know, asked to be back on <laughs> the show? That's a great question, Matt. So I, I had sworn off any type of reality TV after my first experience because I just I did not like producers telling trying to tell me, OK, Ryan, we heard what you said there. Why don't you try saying it this way? Actually, you need to say this instead. And I was just like, no, I'm not going to say that. No, I'm not going <laughs> to do that. You know, at two in the morning, they're asking people to hide in the bushes and come out as they're getting back from their date. And I'm like, why would anybody do that? You're going to make us look like we're some creeper, you know. And But the drunkest person was obviously like, I'll do it. You know, and he obviously lasted longer than I did because he was willing to do these egregious things. Uh, to that point... They approached me, you know, four years later, and I made it very clear that I had no interest in going on. The Bachelor Pad is different, however. Number one, they allowed me to have a platform, and Upstream Arts is a nonprofit I work for, and and I'm a teaching artist for that means the world to me. They allowed that to be my platform, so I got to have some national exposure for a local, um, something that's locally, you know, only in Minnesota. So I, I thought, you know, at the end of the day, who cares what my experience is like if I can get this important organization out there more on a national, you know, level, that's awesome. Second of all, you're playing for $250,000. How often in your life do you have a chance, a one in 10 chance, really? Cause there's 10 guys, 10 girls to win $250,000. Plus it's, you know, it's competition style. There's the California gaming board and license that they have to, adhere to so they can't script it they can't tell which people are going home each week whereas on bachelor at and bachelor and the bachelor they can you know dictate who goes and who stays so there were all these things working and i said you know what at the end of the day why not you know yeah and whereas the bachelorette you don't get paid this you get paid per episode so i i thought you know what give it a shot and going it actually was a lot better it was 
it was a lot of fun. Well, that's good that it was fun. You know, I mean, that's that's all that matters. And it looked like it, it, it would be fun. And, you know, you're down on the beach. It's beautiful. And uh, the sun's shining on you. You catch a tan. You know, you're just hanging out. And obviously there's all these, you know, gorgeous women around. But I, I do, you know, jumping back to football, what was that like? You know, because that's that's another main question I do want to ask you because – I have tons of friends who play football here at Slippery Rock. You know, like I told you, I recently just graduated. They all are so, you know, pushing forward to try to jump into uh, the NFL or the CFL. And what was that like when you got the initial call that you were going to get drafted? Well, it was... It was quite a roller coaster of emotions of a day. Uh, you know, prior to the draft, you're told you're going to be picked anywhere from the third to the sixth round, really, maybe the seventh. But you're pretty confident that you're going to be drafted just because you're hearing from these high ups in these organizations that, hey, we have you at a you know a fourth round grade. And then while the draft's happening, there there's teams calling you, like Dallas called me in the fourth round. Hey, we got a, we're picking a receiver coming up get ready to be a Dallas Cowboy. Well, that comes and goes, and you don't get picked. And so that continued to happen. We had a big gathering at my at my college, and there was about 200 people, friends and family and people of the college that were around. And with every call, they got quiet and excited, and, and it just kept disappointing them because I continued to feel these calls and the anticipation of the next draft pick and then they wouldn't draft me for whatever reason because, you know, the person that's calling you doesn't make the final say. So uh, once the seventh round comes, then you start fielding calls from free agent teams and then your heart just kind of sinks, right? Because you have this expectation, you know, justifiably so though, because you're, you're getting told all these things prior to the draft, but now you're getting calls, hey, it looks like you're falling through the draft. We'd love to We'd love to have you as our undrafted free agent. Well, then the last pick comes, Oakland Raiders, they call, and I got so excited that I hung up on Bill Callahan, who's the head coach, um, just because everybody erupted, and, and I was just like overwhelmed with emotion, and I just pressed end on my phone as opposed to like continuing to talk to him. So <laughs> uh, it probably was a microcosm of what was to come, or a foreshadow of what was to come with my, my career with them, but... Um, it was uh, a pretty surreal experience and, you know, it's just, I felt so bad for people sitting around with me for seven hours, uh, and, you know, for there not to be anything to happen exciting. And then that finally happens. It's pretty sweet. Something else I found so amazing about you that you, you often don't see is that you attended a division three school before you went into the NFL, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, that is correct. Gustavus Adolphus College, not exactly a hotbed for uh, professional talent uh, as it pertains to sports, nor is it, uh, you know, even the Division Three in general. I was the first ever Division Three player to be invited to the NFL Combine, which is something that I, I hold near and dear to my heart. And, you know, I, I wasn't a football player growing up. I was a tennis, soccer. I played basically every sport but football. I attended Wake Forest, uh, obviously big time Division One ACC. Walked on the tennis team, didn't make it. Walked on the soccer team, I made it. And then I overslept my first practice and got cut. And then I decided to transfer and switch sports all together. And I ended up playing uh, football, and then ended up doing track there as well, and a little tennis actually. But uh, I always like to, you know, brag to my friends that I played four sports in college. But ultimately, you know, uh, track and football were were the two that I did the best with, and uh, I ended up being really fast at the right times for the scouts, and because of it, I got on, you know, in the in the Blesto database, and next thing I knew, my senior year, I had scouts out at every single uh, practice coming to check me out. Wow. Wow. And, and the first ever Division three player to get invited to the Combine. That is so amazing. Yeah, you know, it is, and the, the cool thing was that I didn't know how good I was until I got there and saw myself versus this guy from Notre Dame that I had been watching on NBC. I saw this guy from Ohio State that I was like, you just played a national championship. You know, that was the moment where the wow moment for me where I was like, 
I absolutely belong. You know, maybe I'm a little raw in my route running, but I ran the fastest three cone shuttle time or uh, L, L drill at the combine. I wrote, I ran the third fastest uh, short shuttle and you know, I was fast enough in the combine. I had a 38 and a half inch vertical at the combine. So, you know, my, my numbers were as good or better than almost any of the other receivers there. And because of that, it, it helped teams overlook the fact that I hadn't played against elite competition. Now within the NFL, I know that, you know, inside there is different talk and different stuff that happens. Uh, one question, uh, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Um, but I know recent news that has been trending that I've been following myself is with um, Michael Sam. Yeah. Uh, well, what's your? I guess. Well, what's your question about Michael Sam? Well, do you you know kind of obviously you know respect him for the, the move that he made in in coming out? Not to totally catch you off guard, but just to ask you that question since you were. In, uh, you know, you played in the NFL, and you know how, you know, rough and tough the guys are, not to put any, anyone else in false light, but is that, so, you know, do you respect him for, you know, making that initial, you know, coming out and, and saying that he is, uh, you know, gay in the NFL in hopes that others could possibly do the same thing? Not to catch you off guard or, or go no, on. No, no, I'm, I'm happy to, I'll, I'll happily answer that. So Ezra Tuola is... Uh, from my understanding, the first person that came out, but he came out after he was done with the NFL, and he's actually a friend of mine. He lives here locally, an incredible uh, singer now, a professional singer. But uh, Ezra played for the Minnesota Vikings when I was a fan growing up, and so I followed his career, and I always admired the strength that he had to come out after the fact. When you look at Michael Sam, you look at a person that had to, be one of the strongest willed and um, toughest individuals I have ever seen because to come out while you're still playing, sadly in this day and age, that's still a big deal. Um, I commend him, hats off to him, and I would welcome him as a teammate, as a friend, as anything. Um, I feel I feel disappointed in where we're at still in the in the U.S. that it's still something that people don't feel comfortable with in a locker room setting. I, I, I just I don't I don't get that personally. Um, I certainly would have embraced him as a teammate and would have had absolutely no problem having him uh, as a teammate. And I and I wish I would have had an opportunity to talk to him to commend him on his his strength and uh, hopefully. He will be, you know, kind of the setting that that standard for people that, you know, are in the same shoes as he is, and you know that they they will find confidence in in where he was at and and do the same. Exactly, you know, it's just one of those things where you have a guy on the field and on the team who is proving himself, and you know, people are, and it's it's it is sad that he's catching backlash from it, you know, from different individuals and. It's just one of those things where it doesn't need to happen. You know, the guy's proving himself on the team, on the field, and you're supposed to look at him as a teammate and respect him as a teammate. You know, basically everything you just said, if you had the opportunity to play with him. Well, you know, we talk about the NFL being a brotherhood, a, a, a family, a fraternity. The fraternity, right? yes, and, like JB said. If, if there's somebody in your fraternity, if there's somebody in, their, in your family that likes somebody that you know, a, a, you know, likes the same gender or whatever it might be. They have different opinions. They have different thoughts. They have different, you know, who are we to judge, right? I mean, if it truly is a family, if it truly is a fraternity, you should open up your arms and embrace that person because ultimately they're trying to achieve the same thing you are, and that's be the best teammate and team you can be. Exactly. You know, you just gave an amazing answer. I, You know, you're. that's exactly what... I was thinking the same thing. Now, what's your next step, Ryan? Now that you've finished broadcast boot camp, you did a fantastic job, by the way. For everyone who doesn't know, I was honored and privileged to, uh, you know, be in the same group as Ryan. We, I made sure I got you around to where you needed to go. At least I hope I did. 
Heck of a handler, Matt. You are an unbelievable handler. Well, I appreciated it. You know, that means the world to me. Um, so what is the next step for you, Ryan, now that you have finished the boot camp and you're on to bigger and better? You know, I mean, you're a great speaker. You're a great broadcaster. You know, you got the look. You got the voice. You got the words. What's your next move? Yeah, you know, Matt, that that's something we covered the last day. And uh, essentially what my goal in the next month is, is to follow up with the people that I met, network the heck out of all of those people, find some representation as it pertains to a sports agent, sports media, and then just do as many spot, you know, appearances as I can, be it radio, like on your show, or, you know, probably go out to New York and be on SNY. Uh, I know Nate Burleson. He's a good friend of mine. He's a co-host of that show and would love to uh, be on there. And I know a number of our guys have already had that opportunity, so I'll probably head out there for a day. Uh, I'm going to try to get out to L.A. and be on NFL Network and just do a little spot segment there. The more eyeballs that can get put on me at this point while it's still fresh, while people still know my name from that experience, the better. And that's only going to strengthen your demo reel. And then from there, you look at Nate Burleson two years ago, went to broadcast boot camp, and now he's a new CBS guy. Uh, so, you know, and he kind of has walked me through the steps that I need to take. And, and that this all starts with, you know, reps, 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 and getting your face out in front of as many people as possible. It sounds like a fantastic plan. I think you're going to do a fantastic job as well, Ryan. Ryan, what about Good Morning Football? Any word possibly we might be seeing you on Good Morning Football? Well, hey, I I haven't talked to anybody about that, but I would love to, you know, I, I embrace any and all opportunities. Um, and so, you know, again, that is something that came up while we were there, and that's something I need to follow through with. Um, and I have some flexibility with my schedule here in the next three weeks. So that, uh, that's probably the, uh, one of the next steps as well. Well, there you go. And, Ryan, I wish you the best of luck. And I think you're going to do an awesome job. It was an honor uh, you know, hanging out with you. And I cannot wait to hopefully see you on both NFL Network, possibly Good Morning Football, listen to you on the radio, SNY. It's been an awesome time speaking with you. It's been such a great opportunity. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show, for taking the time. Matt, my pleasure. Anytime you want me on, I'm, I'm happy to provide some insight. Then that means we might have to uh, you know, do a follow-up in the future. Sounds good. Ryan, you're the man. Take care, my friend. See you, Matt. All righty.